I've grown up imagining how humans acted. That's been my filter. That's why this was a, an appropriate program for me to go into. But um, they take you to the beginning. And the first thing that they teach you out the gate is the us versus them concept. You have to understand that at the beginning of all time, no matter what, no matter who the humans were over here and who the humans were over there, they were going to look at one another and size up what one another were doing. Do what kind of clothes do you wear? What kind of clothes do, you, do we wear? What kind of food do you eat? What kind of food do we eat? Are uh, based on whether or not we like those things about each other, are we going to allow our, our people to be friends with your people? Are we going to do trade with you or not? Do you play fair according to what we think is fair? Or do we play fair according to what you think is fair? Are we going to let our people marry one another? Like all those things, it's the same kind of um, systemic rollout of, of playing life that, that humans do with one another. It's all based on perception that cannot possibly, can't possibly have uh, the, the total big picture because you're only ever going to be seeing the other from the vantage point. It's like the only thing that allows that to go away is if we have awareness about it. And it doesn't have to go away completely. I'm not you and you're not me. It's okay that we're two different expressions of being human. But to have awareness about it enough and empathy present enough to understand where the other is coming from and understand that at the end of the day, the other's not really the other. The other's only the other in this being an expression. You're your expression, I'm my expression, and all the humans are our expression. So I think the universality um, and the universal language piece is really important. And I would say that we can't jump there, or I haven't seen that we have a way to kind of like hyper um, jump there really fast because the the worldview that we have for our frameworks for how we communicate how we receive information we're used to getting it from the news or now you know facebook and TikTok and things like that all of those things are wired uh with this us versus them framework intact that says that, that there actually has to be a winner and a loser a, a good guy and a bad guy and an enemy in, in order for me to be okay and as long as that's the basis, then it, it, it doesn't have an opportunity to get to the true equilibrium of that it's all, there's this symbiosis and this total system. So I think first is the context. First is the context setting. If we can work on that, you know, context and empathy and connectedness, um, then the universal language will probably be something that is a natural byproduct of that heart shift and mind shift. Tammy Michelle Scarlett is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media, Innovators Magazine, and sponsored by the Lojas Regenerative Foundation. Tammy is a global systems architect, strategist, and futurist, and serves as executive director of the global nonprofit Unify, and you can find them at unify.org. With a graduate degree from Harvard University, she works on global efficiencies for humanity using interdisciplinary cross-sector intelligences. Tammy believes in implementing systemic change with strategic efficiency and abundance for the thriving of our future. Combining her Harvard education and anthropology and MBA studies with her time spent with Native American and First Nation communities, Tammy promotes return to ancient wisdoms and nature to inform global system solutions, including regenerative systems, integrative education for children, and accessible dynamic finance. Her work has been featured on WGN and Forbes, as well as published in the Library of Congress. Tammy, Tammy currently serves on the executive and advisory boards of Connective Consulting, Power of Women, and World Upshift Organization is on the executive advisory team for the Holo Movement and the Universal Peace Sanctuary, and is a collaborator with the World Academy of Arts and Sciences for the United Nations Human Security for All campaign. 
I'm an ambassador with them as well, Tammy. So um, the World Academy of Arts and Sciences, a super organization that was started by Einstein and many other wonderful people in, in our world and, and still going strong. Tammy lives in suburbs Chicago with her husband, their four-year-old daughter, Aurelia, and their pup, Stella Mares. Tammy, it's been a while since I've seen you live and in person, but we actually are good friends and know each other. We've traveled around on tour. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Mark. What a, what a great time to be able to spend this time together today, and I really appreciate you having me on. You're most welcome. Um, your, your biography, I could go on much longer. You've been around uh, for a while doing a lot of good things. I want to start really with with Unify for uh, a lot of people who don't know what Unify is. Can you kind of let us know, tell us a little bit about Unify and also some of the cool things they've been doing around the world and, and uh, who you've been collaborating with? Oh goodness, certainly. Yeah, Unify is a it's a global nonprofit for world peace and impact. And really it got on the map um about 12 years ago with global synchronized meditations. And um I don't know if you remember back in 2012, it was towards the end of the year and everyone's thinking the world might end because it's, we're coming to the end of the Mayan calendar. And people all over the world were converging at these sacred sites and important places on the planet. And uh, we happened to be right there covering it and um, almost journalist broadcast style. We ended up putting out a live broadcast around the globe um, and uh, really, I think, reflected to humanity that we're not alone. Um, everybody who was maybe in a state of wondering what might happen on the planet at that time felt the sense of togetherness, um, connection, that we're all going through this shared experience together. And then in 2016, we were there, boots on the ground uh, at, at uh, Standing Rock. And um, one of our media team partners created the, the Whole World is Watching video, which went extremely viral. Um, we've also had global synchronized meditations that uh, we, had, we were with Deepak Chopra for the one that broke the Guinness Book of World Records for global synchronized meditation. And we saw a combined reach with the UN in Peace Day of 2016 that exceeded 2 billion um, people for the events and broadcasts that year for Peace Day. So we've been here a while, kind of um, just playing our part in facilitating everybody coming together and having these actionable ways to be present, to know that you're not alone, and to move forward in what really needs to be done in the world, but what also gives us a sense of fulfillment of our purpose. That's so beautiful. Um... Two billion people, that's uh, quite, quite big. And, and I know uh, from your social media and kind of Facebook and things that you have qu quite a big just everyday following of people uh, coming around. And are you working on some new things in, in the future with Unify to bring people together again and uh, kind of break that record again, maybe from two billion? And, and what kind of what kind of gatherings or what kind of th actions are you, are you doing to bring people together and what's what's really uh, the hope with with something like that it's interesting because you know years ago if you had caught us at the 2016 2017 juncture I think we would have been talking about technology and we would have said hey we what we probably should do is look over the next few years at building an app or um, you know, I don't know, something in, in that vein, because everything looked like it was just going to continue uh, expanding exponentially with um, Facebook and Instagram and those kinds of things. But I think that what we've been learning in these recent years, especially, is that there is only so much that can happen online in these virtual spaces. And while it's important to be able to foster connection virtually, there is something beneath the surface for humanity that is also part of our shared experience of just being human at this time on the planet that is calling for more, that's hungry and thirsty for a little bit more. We want authenticity. 
Um, we want connection that runs deeper than merely a virtual connection. And we also want to be able to come alive, heal ourselves, heal the world around us, have uh, an understanding of what our individual and collective purposes are and be able to um, be awake and alive and functioning and vibrant in those things. So Unify is, you know, we're, we're looking at that all the time to see how we can best serve that kind of becoming. And we've identified that we are going to be present for not just global synchronized meditations, but global transformational experiences and what different shapes that might take um, over the coming years. And also um, really being present to these moments of even co-facilitation being a collaborative thing, not just not unify being the leader in this in this space or the you know converger of global synchronized meditations. Um, there's something that doesn't even feel a hundred percent fulfilling about that feeling into the energy of the new earth. Um, everybody can do exactly what's theirs to do in their lane and and should and could and it's wonderful. And at the same time, it's like there's a there's um an invitation to explore what's possible when we really come alongside one another and uh, see what happens when we're taking these steps together arm in arm towards the same goal. So one of the things that we're looking at right now is um, all the different groups on the planet that are working on um, activations of sacred sites. So just like I referenced that that was part of the inception of unify kind of getting on the map for the global synchronized meditations but now there are people that go to these sacred sites for all different kinds of reasons there could be frequency resonance that's happening under a certain um, piece of land somewhere that it's important to either know scientifically what's happening there or to know how it affects water um, or to know how that is happening in relation to something that's happening somewhere else in the world, which brings me right back to Rachel Carson and the work that she did, um, understanding how our earth is alive beneath the surface and how these things do relate to one another. There's also people going to those sacred sites uh, because they are keepers of indigenous wisdom or maybe maybe protectors of the site itself, stewards of the site itself. So those people are going there for spiritual reasons or holy reasons or reasons that honor their connection, our connection truly as humans to the land. Um, and then there are people that uh, consider themselves workers of the, the frequency on the land that they're just going there for that reason alone. So there's all these different demographics from 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 science to spiritual to explorers and in between that have different reasons to converge on the planet. And we're exploring ways that we can uh, support that being a, a unified, uh, connected effort so that people have a greater awareness about what their what the context is that they're a part of uh, in the bigger picture. When you're talking about frequencies and these connections and, and part of the bigger picture, as part of this journey, the discovery to find a, a unified language, a unified type of voice or something that resonates with everybody, that everybody understands that regardless of indigenous or banker or language or culture, that, that they all kind of have this unified one, one voice that comes out of it. Is that part of the process in this journey? And, and what does that look like for you? That's such a good question. Um, yeah, I think I wouldn't necessarily call it like a quest for like we're not looking actively for a language as though it's something that we're going to, you know, unbox <laughs> and show the hidden treasure. But I do think that it's the universality of language is kind of in us and all around us. Like it's it's um, I guess I just believe that it's um, present in nature and in us. Um, and so finding it would almost be like, are we willing to just see ourselves in each other <laughs> and the connection that we share? And then I think there are ways that that emerges, um, you know, that where we can see, um, I mean, nonverbal communication is a great example of that. We have the universal smile. And um, I know you guys at, at uh, the Aloha Foundation, you guys have things that you're working on with the resonance project that are very much in this vein. When we were in, in uh, Davos, you you brought a whole room to be silent in I think one and a half seconds <laughs> from from utilizing frequency. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe you were the better one to speak to that <laughs> question. 
I, I think it's so nice because when we, we, we go to a lot of events and there's a lot of events in private, public and, and international organizations that have these events around the world. And there's a lot of different countries and a lot of different languages and many different viewpoints and belief systems and very hard, difficult topics, you know, from religion to war to to horrific things to very beautiful things that all need to kind of be discussed and agreed upon. And we're, and that's kind of why I was mentioned, we're having trouble unifying our voice or getting on the same page or also bringing that collective consciousness with ethics and, and oneness, kinship with one another around the world to kind of take that language or that frequency first to align and then when when we have have a resonance or what we use in the uh, resonance project dot earth is this humming and when we hum together that comes together and it amplifies and it raises that frequency and it makes us all on the same page but it also strengthens one another um, and then we can go and talk about the difficult things after we're kind of in alignment and hopefully at the end do it again and realize, okay, what we just discussed was hard, difficult, and and maybe disagreements, but were we able to come together? Were we able to amplify it? Were we able to solve the problems? Um, and, and so that's kind of the direction of, of how I asked that question and what we're hoping and looking to do, which, which is really interesting. And, um, not only with what you said, but also um, with with the question is just not too long ago, um, another podcast host, much more famous me, Joe Rogan, had Terrence Howard on on his podcast show. And uh, if anybody has listened or knows Terrence Howard, he's really big on uh, the unified field. He's very big on frequencies. He's very big on um using frequencies as uh, uh, in math and in science and physics on how the world works. And I, I truly believe that that is something that we've, we're, we're coming closer to and we're on this journey. It's, it's coming, it's, it's becoming clearer all the time, but it's really interesting to see how, how that's emerging. Having, um, Having said that, you and I, as you mentioned, we we traveled to the COP28 uh, in Dubai. We were at the Dubai Future Forum and Foundation uh, in, in Dubai as well. Then we traveled together to DLD Munich. And we went from there to um, the World Systemic Forum. Then from there to... Uh, to Davos, to the World Economic Forum, and did open form stuff, closed form stuff, and uh, um, just traveled around and spoke together. And it was just a journey. It was uh, amazing. And you and I unified, got to know each other and speak together and see, see many things. But that's kind of a journey, not only for unify and for yourself, but as going through this um, the global trends, the different unique and ancient places, but also the groups who are really kind of aligning to go forward. Can you tell us about what's on the horizon this year and into the future, what, what you'll be doing and why and what's taking you on these journeys, what's interesting and emerging? Oh, certainly. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was a, it was a journey. And, and thank you for journeying um, with me and allowing me to journey alongside you. Um, uh, it, it really was a few months of amazing meetings, amazing rooms, amazing um, conversations, because for me, everything was leveled up from, from the way that it's been in the past, where people maybe come across one another and trade business cards and see if there's some, you know, business deal <laughs> to be made, some profit, some win-win, which is nothing wrong with a win-win. That's great. But um, this was a, this was an up level from that. So, um, and I do want to touch on what you had mentioned before about universal language, which um, for Unify, I mean, we deal with this 
all the time. As you can imagine, we have 2.3 million organic followers on Facebook. Um, this audience wants authenticity and they want their, their version of what that means. And so every person's unique and individual worldview that's completely framed from whatever they have had the opportunity to perceive um, defines that. And so we're always having to look and, and say, um, how do we frame something in a way that, um, that it is really getting to the essence of a thing? Because it's not about a message being palatable to an audience, that's marketing. You can send anything to a spin doctor and have it spun right up so that it's palatable, palatable or um, performs better with a certain test market. And that's not what Unifies in the business of. What we really do want to kind of discover the purity of the essence of a message and whatever that, whatever that is. And oftentimes we don't know in the beginning because we're all just doing this together. Like all of us humans on the planet are going through this juncture, nobody has ever gotten past 2024 before unless you're a time traveler <laughs> and so so I here wish. we are doing this yeah here we are doing this together and um and so we we truly discover uh universal languaging as a team um all the time different ways that we can be present with something remove the polarity from it or allow the polarity to be present but not make it mean anything about anybody because that's also okay it's okay for there to be conflicting sides of a thing that hurt you know that's that's part of the real human experience but it doesn't have to mean that you are bad and i'm good or that i'm bad and you're good or that that's the enemy so we have to do this consequence really quick so we can feel like everything got leveled out and now we can continue that's a weird old kind of survival mechanistic thing that isn't necessary for bringing us where we need to be in the new world so if we can set that aside long enough to get to the roots of these issues and really be present with one another um and actually that so i have a, a book that's um that is uh planning to launch in spring of next year and this is part of what i talk about in in the book because as you, as you can imagine studying anthropology at harvard they start at the ground floor of like, you gotta go all the way back, the beginnings of humanity. Can you imagine how humans acted and how they have acted? Well, I've grown up imagining how humans acted. That's been my filter. That's why this was a, an appropriate program for me to go into. But um, they take you to the beginning and the first thing that they teach you out the gate is the us versus them concept. You have to understand that at the beginning of all time, no matter what, no matter who the humans were over here and who the humans were over there, they were going to look at one another and size up what one another were doing. Do what kind of clothes do you wear? What kind of clothes do you do we wear? What kind of food do you eat? What kind of food do we eat? Are uh, based on whether or not we like those things about each other. Are we going to allow our our people to be friends with your people? Are we going to do trade with you or not? Do you play fair according to what we think is fair? Or do we play fair according to what you think is fair? Are we gonna let our people marry one another? Like all those things, it's the same kind of um, systemic rollout of, of playing life that, that humans do with one another. It's all based on perception that cannot possibly, can't possibly have uh, the, the total big picture because you're only ever gonna be seeing the other from the vantage point. It's like the only thing that allows that to go away is if we have awareness about it and it doesn't have to go away completely. I'm not you and you're not me. It's okay that we're two different expressions of being human, but to have awareness about it enough and empathy present enough to understand where the other is coming from and understand that at the end of the day, the other's not really the other. The other's only the other in this being an expression. You're your expression, I'm my expression, and all the humans are our expression. So I think the universality um, and the universal language piece is really important. And I would say that we can't jump there, or I haven't seen that we have a way to kind of like hyper um, jump there really fast because the the worldview that we have for our frameworks for how we communicate how we receive information we're used to getting it from the news or now you know facebook and TikTok and things like that all of those things are wired uh with this us versus them framework intact that says that, that there actually has to be a winner and a loser a, a good guy and a bad guy and an enemy in, in order for me to be okay 
And as long as that's the basis, then it, it, it doesn't have an opportunity to get to the true equilibrium of that it's all, there's the symbiosis in this total system. So I think first is the context, first is the context setting. If we can work on that, you know, context and empathy and connectedness, um, then the universal language will probably be something that is a natural byproduct of that heart shift and mind shift. That's beautiful. Yeah. And uh, I hope I can tickle the name of your book, Dropping Spring 2025, Birthright. Um, maybe you'll change by that time, but I'm, I'm excited to see it. And I love, I love the topic. So that it's, it's a deep one that we could go into right away. So I used to have a, a, a company called Homo, uh, Academia Homo Universalis. And, and I, I'm not sure, uh, if today I believe that, um, you know, we should have a new uh, term, homo universalis or homo symbios uh, um, or, or something like that, because we almost need to create a new genus. And I was speaking to Emmanuel Kuntz from the Holo Movement. He he was actually saying the same thing. He says, I think we need a new genus uh, in, in, uh, um, for humanity as well. But there are some interesting things with with your book and the kind of the direction that you're going in that talk about quite a bit is uh, these uh, ecological civilizations or the civilization frameworks that we've had in the past that have all collapsed that uh, we kind of learn from from deep history and also the the beginnings of life on earth and how civilizations kind of what models they were running and functioning on and uh, some people who have really written some good things about um, how those civilization uh, works and how frameworks work or Hannah Arndt and, and um, the Parkinson's law from uh, the, and the Peter principles are, are some good ones. But then there's also these, uh, the big handy study that was done by NASA, which is real interesting where they went through and they kind of said, you know, how many civilizations have existed before in our world, you know, and uh, they came back and said, there's been 32 civilization frameworks in our world that have existed before, and they all collapsed, but five of them collapsed because of uh, ecological or environmental collapse. And then those five that collapsed, not because of ecological or environmental collapse, collapsed because of disease, disruption, or displacement. But we're learning that all 32 collapsed early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Greeks, Romans, because they were all running the same framework model, which is a hierarchy model where one person's at the top and peasants, slaves, laborers, and uh, farmers were at the bottom. And that, that was really unique to say, you know, they were all hierarchy models. That's something that kind of is set up here. It's not a really good system. And then, um, when you mention symbiosis, which is a very regenerative model, it's a very inclusive model. It's one that re rejuvenates and renews. One other thing that they found out is that none of those indigenous people uh, or none of those people in the frameworks of early antiquity, Mesopotamia, Greeks, Romans, that were peasants, slaves, laborers, and farmers were indigenous to that civilization. They had all been taken from some other culture, some other language, enslaved, brought in to do the bottom of the pyramid work to build up the civilization. And they realized that they didn't have that buy-in to the system, the buy-in to that life, to the framework, to the civilization that they were stuck into. And uh, this is what they don't know. They don't know if that was the cause because they didn't have buy-in and they weren't indigenous and they weren't enslaved, if that's why it also led to the collapse because they just didn't care or that once it got built up large enough, the system was built up not to sustain those people anymore and they either had to go somewhere else or they all, they knew that the rest of their life would be in slavitude or in farmer and, and something that wasn't no ownership to themselves and so that the entire thing failed and so a, a really long question long story is how do how would that relate to something in, in your birthright and how as you're with unify in today's modern day unifying large groups of people and what you're seeing 
and, and your studies and the work you're doing and what you're doing with Unify, how how that's emerging and what you're seeing new models come up and, and that we should be aware about that hopefully you're going to talk to us about in your book as well. Wow, Mark, I, I'm so grateful that you um, you occasionally do these history deep dives because it's so juicy and I hope it makes people just want to go Google a bunch of stuff and pick up books and make sure that they know all the <laughs> all the background information. That's what that's how it makes me feel. Um, I uh, man, nobody likes to be a slave to anything, and we we hear about it all the time in our society and people um, people are talking about how they can't even afford to buy homes in cities that they've like grown up in, even if they've been there, you know, saving for 20 years because, um, you know, inflation and home prices rising and all this is just, it just has created a new system where even just normal is inaccessible. And um, I think I imagine that being a slave in those systems, I had watched recently the the Moses special on, um, on uh, Netflix and I grew up with that story uh, because I, I grew up in church and I was super familiar with it. But this Netflix special was cool because they invited people from all different religious backgrounds and historians to comment on it. And one of the things that they brought up was that um, the the slaves, the, the Hebrews had been enslaved in Egypt for so long. I think it was like 400 years that they um, had really actually gotten a little bit disconnected from their own um, not the traditions, they had those, but this from the spirit of the traditions, almost like, well, what is it that we're really actually believing in? Uh, it wasn't as though they were even trying to flee Egypt because that's where they got their food and that's what they knew and that's where their children played. Like it was, it actually had become their life. But to your point, their, all the traditions that they were there supporting were not their own. It was like they were, they had their little mini um dome of life like forcefully tucked inside this larger one that they were there to make thrive and and i see similarities to that in our current economic systems because um you know parents work two three jobs to ensure that they're there they can put food on the table or that their kids can go to school and then the time that they get to actually see their children during these limited 18 years of life is um, is hardly even there. And that's, that is not, that breaks my heart. That's not quality of life. Um, and when I look at our systems, I see, I see that profit drives everything and that's the bottom line. And that's also heartbreaking because profit is completely made up. Um, money is completely made up. We have ways to thrive that don't even require money. We just created it as a form of exchange, and it's actually a form of inequitable exchange. If you think about it, what the introduction of money to a system that never had it, what it does is it says that now we're able to start creating leverages that allow for there to be disparity. That's actually the benefit of having profit systems. And I'm not trying to like poo-poo profit. I like that's I I think monetizing things is brilliant. I, I advise in business sectors all the time. I'm just talking about from a humanities evolution standpoint and from the disparity between what it is that we kind of say that we want or desire um, for the things that are most meaningful in life and then the role that profit plays in those right now. And the way that it works is that profit is driving all of these things that must happen. They have to happen because, you know, God forbid there's the collapse of any of, of these um, uh, profit-driven economies. And um, therefore, that means that all these people have to go work these jobs that they don't like, um, hours that are probably less than humane, um, and then have a lower quality of life. And it, it just isn't, that isn't a win for, for anyone. And I, Mark, I think about long-term plans, okay? I, I was, earlier this year, I was sitting in my living room thinking like, who is out there thinking about the 100 million year plan for the planet? Because I I need to talk to whoever that is. Like, we've got to start thinking longer um, than, than just like, oh, what are we going to do about the next five years? Five years has come and gone already. And the next five is going to come and go. And I know we're at, we're always going to be at pivotal junctures as long as we're in this kind of um, uh, malleable uh, space until things are on a different track. So that's not new, but what are we trying to cultivate that's way, way, way beyond ourselves? And I, I want to be able to look at that too. So in terms of the the, the slavery um, versus what's possible, I think we've got to move our mindsets out of that. And this is why in my in my book, Birthright is about 
exactly that. It's our it's our birthright. It's not against any one particular system, but it's our birthright that is in symbiosis to the planet. When I think about that in my own life, my moments of uh, knowing how close I am with our planet and really how close I am like with God and our planet all at the same time and each other have been maybe when I'm drinking like a glass of water or when I'm like eating an orange. I held an orange in my hand one time that I had gotten at the grocery store and I just all of a sudden thought, oh my gosh, you've come on the longest journey. Like you just came to me all the way from Florida. Like whose hand picked you off that tree and who, what kind of a crate were you stuck in and was the road bumpy and where did you go? Like, what was it? Because I, it wasn't that like I needed to know this orange is the whole little journey, but I, I didn't get to touch it on the tree. Like I didn't get to have that moment where I felt that it had had this entire life. And then in this moment, it's transferring that to me. And then I have gratitude for its nourishment. I realized that in that moment, that, that, that whole journey meant that most of the time I just walk into a grocery store and pick out whatever the prettiest orange is that isn't too squishy and isn't too firm. And then I put that in my cart and I take it home and I'm maybe thankful that I get some vitamin C. But it's like there's so much more to that, that that orange is like this precious, precious moment of connection and exchange that I was born unto. Like I was born here for that exchange and I'm part of it. I'm part of it with it. And same thing with the water. Like I drink the water and it becomes me and, and it's part of our earth becoming me. And the same thing with all of our, our processes that our bodies, you know, go through. There's a, there's a reciprocity. There's an exchange that's innate and it's not just physical or physiological. It goes beyond that because we have these connections to all those things that we were talking about before, uh, like frequency. And for anybody who thinks that frequency is too woo-woo to talk about in these terms, I just want to note that it was only a couple hundred years ago that we didn't know that radio waves existed. So <laughs> we're, we're talking about things that we know more and more that they do exist. Uh, Einstein, Tesla, they, they, they all talked about these things. And there's so much science to back it up now. We don't even need to call it the noetic sciences because now it is just also part of science. Um, and quantum physics is backing that every every uh, new theory and discovery that we see. So I just want to drop that in there, that, that frequency is a deeply, deeply important piece of the conversation um, that that is about how we are connected to the planet and one another. So for me, the book Birthright is about um, that that opportunity for us to go ahead and have everything that we came here for, to go ahead and be everything that we came here for, to be in connection, to light up, to be alive, and not be afraid that that changes things because it's not going to require systems to crumble. It doesn't require that. That's not necessary. You don't have to go in and play a game of risk and topple things in order for new life to be birthed. Even forests and rainforests will show us that. It can just emerge from, from the ground up elegantly and seemingly slowly, although it will happen overnight. You won't, you'll, you'll stand there in front of it. You won't see anything moving. But the next day you come back and there's a whole new thing of growth. How did that happen? That is this kind of, of growth that is, that is um, available for us on the planet. So I've gone on and on enough about that, but that's a little snippet of, uh, of well, the it, kind of stuff. Well, it really that, all uh, in ties into uh, birthright. So we're talking about universal language. We're talking about uh, indigenous. We're talking about um, civilizations and the, the, it's not even the enslavement. So when you run any system, any, uh, any organization, uh, and the people in that civilization framework and that organization and that model don't have a buy-in to the system, then uh, that's when you don't have that birthright. You don't feel like it's yours. You don't feel like you're part of it. And then you're, then people tend to think, what am I doing? I, I'm never going to own this. I never have a part of it. I never get to enjoy it myself. I'm just uh, uh, mechanistically a cog in the wheel, so to say. I'm insignificant. And birthright when when i hear that i think of you know we are star stuff we are stardust you know we're made up of the basic elements of this earth and carl sagan's you know this you know we see this rising consciousness consciousness growing that sees the earth as a single organism and an organism divided amongst itself as doomed and i just um 
when, when I hear birth threat, I'm thinking we've got the buy-in. We're part of it. We that we have this universal language and alienable right that makes us all indigenous and makes us all connected and makes us all connected to the earth. And and uh, um, you probably know just as much as anybody, I'm far from woo-woo um, and very cautious um, w with that. Um, but it's not woo-woo. It's the way life works. It's the way the world works. It's science. It's math. It's deep frequency. And when, when we talk about frequency that people would say is woo-woo, uh, most of those people probably have never had a, had a relative or been themselves in the hospital or at a clinic and had an MRI machine, which is a magnetic resonance imager that resonates into your body to look at the atoms and things in your body to see how you're doing using resonance, using frequency. Um, and there's a lot of things in our world that we, we use frequency and what some people might think is woo-woo, um, sonar and, and all sorts of things, music um, to do wonderful things with. And it's not woo-woo at all. It's actually fun. It's beautiful and it's life. And um, So I'm glad we touched upon that because it's nice uh, how – how deep your book goes, but also giving us some hope and, and some some kinship of, of where we're going. So I'm excited to see that from you. Uh, along with that lines, you've got some journeys planned this year and into the future with some different um, events and different organizations and things like uh, re the Regen Week in Tulum and and uh, possibly another Davos next year and possibly another COP this year in Azerbaijan and things. I know you've been to different events like Bioneers or you've seen these things around the world emerge. Would you like to touch on this global trend that we're seeing in transdisciplinary and cross-sector collaboration and what that means and what you're seeing and what does that feel like? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Tulum uh, Regen Week was earlier this year, and I couldn't actually make that one, but we did have Unify representatives and Impact Portfolio representatives there. Um, it, uh, but And that one's been going on for a while. However, the feedback that I got from that was that there was a little more conversation this year about um, the collaborative nature of things. Um, and uh, Bioneers is another one. The Holo Movement was uh, present there, um, hosting a panel there. And that's a, a group that has a history of promoting innovative solutions to global environmental and social challenges with people like Paul Hawken and Vandana, Vandana Shiva. Um, and yeah, Davos, we were there uh, this last year. I went the first time the year prior to that. And what I experienced the first year was kind of this neat feeling of, wow, there's an awful lot of talk about um, collaboration that was just, it was like a buzzword in some some rooms. And I didn't feel like prior to that, I had heard it very much in, in business sectors or where public meets private um, as being all that common, um, other than where it's deemed necessary to get a particular outcome. Uh, certainly not in just an explorative way. Um, so there was a lot that leading up to this year, I, I was like kind of watching those those trends. But this year I've seen something new and I did want to share. I actually made some notes about it because I wanted to share specifically about some of the ones that I've been invited to recently um, and what I'm seeing there. So just listen to these and see. I'm going to read you a little bit of de descriptions for three different events. and. Um, you know, maybe tell me what you think we can discuss after. Um, so this one is for frequency that I was invited to in uh, Costa Rica. It happened in March. And my friends, Ramayan and James Seraph of Logos, along with former CEO of Singularity University and actually advisor for us on the impact portfolio, Rob Nail, um, were there and facilitating this event. Um, now, their, their write-up on this includes the following words. You are one of the rare humans who's truly a unicorn. You've excelled in business, usually on your second or third plus mountain. You're deep in your spiritual growth, you live an incredible life, and you likely desire to create Earth 2.0, a regenerative, sovereign future that combines ancient wisdom and modern technology. 
to include a quote by Charles Eisenstein that says, the future all our hearts know is possible. Frequency's purpose is to support global leaders and conscious investors, upgrading their life network fearlessly, stepping into their greater purpose, and beginning the co-creation of Earth 2.0. And why the time is now? We are in an unprecedented time in humanity, arguably the most important of our lifetime, if not in human history. We have war raging, nuclear threat, climate change, AI risk. Our species has a one-sixth risk of extinction by the end of 2100, according to Toby Ord. At the same time, there is a strong hope. We have a global awakening occurring at a rapid rate and more tools and resources at our disposal than ever before. We must come together and unite, not only to better the lives of ourselves, our families, our businesses and communities, but to birth a new society at large. The next guru will not be an individual, but a community. So that's the first one. The second one I wanna mention is Future Horizons, which is happening in Italy in July that I will be attending. Uh, you actually set me up with this one, Mark, so thank you You're for welcome. that. You're welcome. Um, they have on theirs, their uh, kind of call out to people, join the movement to write a new story for humanity, an intimate and exclusive gathering of 200 action-oriented futurists and visionary entrepreneurs, investors, tastemakers of culture and industry, and humanitarians actualizing a symbiotic future. Enter a realm that whispers of a timeless tale of the many faces and enduring bonds. We return to a familiar place where community was first born, a village. Here lies a secret. In this village, we create the future. Future Horizon is more than a forum for seminal dialogue. Here, where technology and nature and humans are in balance, we co-create and move into the symbiocene. And Hank Rogers, who's the founder of Tetris and Blue Planet Alliance, called this Future Horizons gathering, Ted meets Burning Man. I know Hank, yeah, he's a one. real great guy. He was also in Dubai uh, and we were at that, remember we were at the, uh, uh, Atlanta, what is it? The Atlantis Hotel and the Aquarium, the hidden ch yeah. hidden chamber or something where the, uh, the fish tank was with just jaw dropping and he gave a nice talk there, but yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And then, and that was a fun time too. Uh, and then the third one is um, this group called Earth One. This just rolled out um, most recently. They just launched it. It's taking place of, in November of this year. Their write-up says, a crossing of the Atlantic Ocean from mainland Portugal to the Azores to Puerto Rico with 300 of the world's most capable leaders growing a regenerative world. Earth One is a global alliance of influential, generous, and daring leaders collaborating to catalyze a new approach to social and environmental stewardship. We believe a regenerative future, a world where human activities contribute to the continuous renewal and flourishing of life on Earth, is possible within our lifetime. We exist to weave together the world's most catalytic leaders in service of this future. We're hosting a series of immersions focused on these impact, uh, on specific impact theses. Our midpoint is our first global assembly, which is the Atlantic Crossing. These gatherings serve as flashpoints for expanding global perspective cross-pollinating people and ideas, and illuminating paradigm-shifting projects capable of inspiring civilization towards a regenerative future. Um, now, I kind of want to ask what your thoughts on that are uh, before I share what else I was going to share. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you brought those up. And we're, and you, you've only touched upon a few because there's probably a, a, another two dozen um, that are almost as good as these as well that are out there doing amazing events and and things bringing people together bringing true leaders together and um they're all having different formats some some people are actually bringing unicorns together to build the future to build earth 2.0 some of them are building bringing the top people together to talk like in a conference format some are bringing them together to do an unconference some of them are actually starting new manifestos and and bill of rights and and actually coming forward and say we've created a new system we've got everybody here on board and, and we want to roll this out to the world Others are creating a movement like the Holo movement where we will be going uh, and 
having everybody have a buy-in and have the voice that they feel called to to use and at the level that they're comfortable with where they stand now to kind of uh, go on journey. So it's emerging more and more. And it's uh, there's key words in there. It's cooperation, collaboration, regeneration, regenerative, uh, ecological civilizations, Earth 2.0 a lot of talk about futures. And so futures should never be just one one future. It should be plural, it should be multiple futures because um, there's a lot of people working on it and it, it can be different for many different people. There could be different types of futures and possibilities that we could achieve and, and we could come at the cusp of um, a solar punk future. And then realize that we need to go a little bit, uh, a little bit more away from the punk and more into the symbiosis. Or we realize that we need a little bit more technological help, or that we need a little bit um, more grounded help, more nature's help, and, and connection with nature to to help us on this journey. So there's a lot of different things uh, that I see emerging there. Um, and as you know, and I'll let you ask your your, your question or your follow-up to, to this as well. I've been working for, for a while now on a bigger um, transformation as well for, for the world. It's called, um, well, it's been framed as a, a setup calling it the uh, World That Works For Everyone Fellowship Gathering, bringing together the world's greatest thinkers and leaders and facilitators and scientists and economists and, uh, and uh, everybody who needs to have a, a, a seat at the table for this next operating system for humanity. And so you and I have been speaking about that and working working on that to bring it to, to birth it to the world as well. Um, so that's something that I see coming in downloads or coming to a lot of different people. It's just extremely difficult um, to place place the time, the place, and make sure that it's diverse and everybody's included and, and birth that to the world. Um, so that it can it can be right. I mean, when you when you spoke earlier at the beginning of the podcast, uh, and I was talking about Unify, we were talking about how we were at the the United Nations, and then at the World Economic Forum, and and how you have this big following of two billion people who did the meditation, and two about two million on Facebook, and everybody's got a different diversity. And then I always think, okay. Well, is is everybody on board, or do some people not like us at the United Nations, or do not some people not like us at the WEF? And how do we kind of break everyone's borders down and truly have this universal mission uh, that that we're we're in this together, we're in it all together, the good, bad, and ugly. And I I I've said it before when when we were out traveling. We need the shitty perspective. We need the bullshit out there because it adds to and it makes great compost. And you, you mentioned bad economic models. I think we should compost late stage capitalism, make some good compost out of it and build a new economic model. And the same thing with people who are building up walls, borders and racism and, and all the other really bad, stinky, bullshitty things in our world. Um, they'll probably always exist, but let's use that and bring everybody together to build a nice compost for real fertile soils, for real fertile futures that are abundant, thriving and flourishing and, and use that. We, we need to see that the world's not always rosy, that there are people who disagree, but that could be a, a nice mix to create a nice uh, diverse compost where we can have have something thriving and flourishing. But that, that I'll, I'll stop there and let you <laughs> kind of finish your thoughts or ask your question. No, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm glad that you brought up the fellowship and the gathering because I was hoping that, um, that, that, that you would touch on that and that it would come up. I think, um, you know, one of the, the trends that I 
was seeing with all of this is started for me uh, a few years back with this desire. I think it, in my best estimation, I think it kind of happened with the pandemic because it, the pandemic made everybody, um, uh, you know, have to go indoors and be cut off from everything and, and be a little bit alone and, um, and have this kind of shared experience. And thereafter, there seemed to be this openness for collaboration that was new. And so I started seeing what I was calling exponential collaboration. And I've heard the term exponential collaboration used a number of times over the past few years, sometimes meaning slightly different things. Um, but I, you know, I've, I guess I've been seeing that over these years. And then now I feel like it's moving into something else. And it's, uh, but to your point of, hey, it's, it can be tricky. It's a little difficult to know how do we do this at a, at a place? How do we do this at the right time? And really, how do we do it in the right ways? Because there's not a manual <laughs> that's like that they're gonna, someone's going to hand over and be like, here's how you do it for the these like new earth systems to usher in an age for a world that works for everyone. Um, I, I guess there are plenty of things that we know can work. And at the same time, we really have to be um, kind of fully switched on in our in our beings and aware and listening and paying attention to what it is that that has been ingrained in us to do um, versus what it is that's available for us today. And this is another thing that I mentioned in my book, which is um, about every little thing that we do. For me, every day right now, I I don't assume that anything that I worked before is going to work today. And even if it does work today, I'm going to kind of assume it might not be the best possible way to go about doing it. So I start my days these days. Really, this is just moving into this year for me that I started doing this. So I start my days these days specifically asking if there's a higher intelligence way that I can invite in to be a part of something I'm doing, whether it's a meeting or a solution that needs to be posed or a, a challenging conversation that needs to be had or whatever. And I'm blown away at the number of times that a new solution does come in. And I'm seeing this evidenced in my own life, but I'm also seeing it evidenced in groups, um, in uh, uh, committees of some of these organizations, that when we pause and we just kind of get ourselves in a good heart coherence and we listen, um, that there's, there's, uh, there's something else that's possible. So I think it's normal for everybody to kind of, we, we see these effects happening in the world where a lot of people get the download at the same time. I think that's happening. A lot of people are kind of experiencing that it's natural for us to be collaborating more fully right now. Not only that, but it's necessary for us to be utilizing the best of what humanity has available, um, coming alongside each other, making these things, uh, allowing these things to get a forward trajectory. And at the same time, it probably will happen by nature that will just default to, well, how do we action things as humans right now? Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> because I just went through it in the month of April, my own kind of processing and figuring out what I default to as a human and what I determine to be progress, what I believe is progress based on, on what I value. I didn't even know until I went through the process myself, but it was like schedule a meeting, identify an outcome, uh, perform the thing that needs to be performed, and then measure the outcome according to the prediction, right? It's very, very linear. Um, Mechanistic and, and like almost. Smart mechanistic and and smart goal style right it's which is great from for moving you from point a to point b i'm, I'm not trying to poo-poo it it's amazing smart goals all day long let's get out there and get stuff done linear tracks are great and if we want something that's exponential that i believe is available to us that's exponential we've got to loosen ourselves up from that track because then the only thing that's going to get us is these linear returns so when we have people that are getting all these downloads all over the planet in, in these leadership positions and putting on amazing events and inviting people that are very capable, that are influential, um, that, that maybe have funding or whatever things are that are needing to move these things forward. And then we go back to carrying that out through only old linear models. We're putting a ceiling on it that doesn't need to be there. And I'm not here to say I have all the answers for how it needs to look. But what I am here to say is that I'm grateful that I get to collaborate with you, Mark, on some of these um, uh, really not just examples, but experiments almost, um, trial and error. How, how can we iterate how this can look? Um, and, and doing that with heart open, mind open, um, what are some new ways that it, that it can look and then try that instead of it just needing to be these old templates in order to, to deem it successful. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, when the, the uh, fellowship and gathering get off the ground, I'm going to be popping champagne. <laughs> I will too. Yeah. That's, I, I totally agree with you on the, this 
the old the old way of doing it or the way that is good and smart goals and things but it's very um incremental growth you can never get beyond 10 percent and and uh, something that kind of falls in line with that is um a couple of things one is you hear a lot you know what are the kpis what are the key performance indicators well the minute that comes up i you just know it's very linear siloed thinking it's very incremental you'll never get into the future with that thinking because it's past performance indicators and it's very linear and small it never gets you out of this incre uh, incremental growth phase into that exponential and we've uh We've heard it when we were on tour together and um, spoken about it as well. In all living systems, you and I are a living system, but in ecology and biology, all living systems, one plus one is not two. It's a super exponential. It's quantum tunneling. It is uh, exponential, um, so, you know, beyond exponential. It's a super exponential. Um, and that is life. Life is regenerate regenerative and abundant if we do it right and we get all the factors in. But if you're micromanaging, you're doing linear and siloed thinking, it's very, um, very much incremental growth. And it's stifling to not only have a business model or a society model um, that can really, really do and grow and, and do beautiful things. There's this, um, This thing that I want to bring up that I think is so important in our world, there's a, a segment of of children called early learners. It's uh, five grades. It's kindergarten, preschool, first grade, second grade, and third grade. Those five grades. It's just the the beginnings of children getting into the education system. In our world today, of just over eight billion people today. Um, May 19th, 2024, we would need to build 66,000 classrooms every single week. 66,000 classrooms every single week just to have enough classrooms for those early learners to just begin their education, to just start off on life with the basics. There's tons of controversy out there as far as what kind of education and how good it is it and and what we teach and, uh, and and things like that. I want you to know that around the world today, not even in one month do we build a hundred classrooms in a month, let alone sixty six thousand every single week. And that's just one tiny facet of the infrastructure and the incremental growth of our world, where we're going. Humanity is growing exponentially. Our earth is growing exponentially. Every single day, we're moving fast into the future. But our infrastructures, the way we live, it's still in the Industrial Revolution. We haven't even got our schools up to speed. We haven't even got everyone on this planet clean water and sanitation. We haven't got anybody on this earth a place to live or, or renewable energy or highways or roads, just the basic infrastructure needs of food. Um, and so I, I, I think for me, when I hear, you know, what you're talking about, I'm, I'm on board because we need to get into the thinking to act. How does life work? And it works very abundant, very uh, exponential because every day, thousands of cells die off in our body and new ones grow and, and we have these transformations through our entire life and our whole world is growing that way. But these systems that we're stuck in are very outdated. I think that it's time to change. And so that's why I'm glad you brought that up. Well, yeah, Mark. I mean, I my friend Amitabh is um, in India and he works with several large global organizations and his organization is called the Yuva Unstoppable and they're doing that, building um, classrooms, tech classrooms, clean bathrooms um, for children. And there's, yeah, the work is endless. It's, they've, um, I mean, they're even, 
they've been well funded, like people show up and, and give them money to do these things. And yet the need is so great. Um, so I really hear you on kind of the scaling, like how are we going to keep up with the exponential, exponential nature um, of our linear paths, the, the linear need. <laughs> and then it's like, we have to be able to allow ourselves to move into exponential type frameworks to get there. Living um, systems is the best way. You know, we, we yeah. have governance yeah. and infrastructure that's living. It's constantly rejuvenating and regenerating and growing. It, it's kind of more mm -hmm. of a process of how the world works. And seeing, and maybe I think, I mean, in my estimation, I would say seeing ourselves in less um, kind of consumeristic frameworks, because if I'm here consuming, I, I cannot be in a state of um, symbiosis or reciprocity with anything around me. Um, that's one thing that I've been thinking about quite a bit this year. There was a good part on the podcast with Emmanuel where we talk about that. We talk about Lynn Margulis and symbiosis and the single-celled organism that came became a multi-celled organism and how that process occurred. And, and it's a form of uh, growth and it's a form of growth and not consumption, but envelopment of one organism enveloping the other, but it didn't kill it. It, it enveloped it and then they grew into two, uh, two cells and, and then multiplied. And that's how we got there. And I think it, it, it uh, there's a certain form of, um, I'm against degrowth. I'm kind of post growth in that, but I think there's a, an abundant way to live and grow in this symbiosis that's inherently abundant and we can have enough and we can eat enough and we can have good infrastructures, but it really has to be living. It has to be rejuvenating, continually uh, going through this, this process of life or as a living organism. That's really the key. And when we talk about reductionism, mechanization, or this linear, as we get into these organizations and, and they don't even think about our families at home and they don't, you know, it's this, the second thing I was going to tell you about is this work-life balance. They expect you to be someone different at work than they expect you to be someone different at, at home. And it doesn't exist. It's just pure bull. <laughs> it's pure bullshit yeah. that you're one person at work and another person at home. That probably means you're schizophrenic, bipolar, or have some kind of a burnout situation because you can't be two people at once. There's only life and it's all one thing at all the time and um if if you had to separate the two out or find some balance you would constantly be fighting against uh against life and we need to involve more life systems into our organizations into the business we do because we're not in the business of business we're in the business of life we're about living and living far into intergenerational futures so that it covers, you know, more than eight generations into the future, uh, more than 100 million years that you're looking for. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's so, so good. That's so, so good. Just being plugged in in a way that allows that to be to be true, because, I mean, even just the reality of waking up in the morning and thinking, I feel sick today, but I can't call in sick because I can't afford to take another day off or whatever the thing is that might be. That's just kind of a normal part. I mean, people do that all the time. This is a normal part of our of our systems. And it's, it's not reflective of the values that most people would say that they want. And so how do we begin to have these like living systems like you're talking about that are reflective, not only what we want, but who we are, reflective of life, of systems that can sustain life creating what what do you say creating well yeah that's the definition like of of regeneration or symbiosis it's really a uh, definition is to create the conditions that are conducive for life to thrive and flourish amid ever changing life conditions no matter what happens you're always creating these conditions that are conducive for life to thrive and flourish and um you, you could put it in, in a different way. You're always creating organizational conditions for your employees and customers and your contractors to thrive and flourish, that they have enough tools, enough resources, enough materials, enough time, 
enough support to thrive and flourish. And then what happens? Then your organization thrives and flourish and your customers thrive and flourish and your employees thrive and flourish. It's just a better model. Uh, the model of life is, is one that's just worked for 3.8 billion years and that's pretty darn good and it's beautiful. And uh, we, we, we need to figure out um, after all this time that let's stop fighting it. Let's just give in and, and become part of this uh, symbiotic earth and move forward because it's so much fun and it feeds our soul and, and it, it drives uh, all sorts of beautiful things on this planet. That's so good. It's amazing. Yeah, you were you were talking about um, the KPIs, the KPIs being linear, and it made me chuckle a little bit because um, in the impact portfolio, which we haven't uh, touched on here very much yet today, um, there we do utilize KPIs for for our reporting, and in fact, we have our, our fund manager is a former global managing partner at Accenture. And um, his consulting firm wrote the performance management systems for Accenture and actually um, gave those that they retained uh, to the impact portfolio. So we have these Accenture level performance management um, systems and identified KPIs. One of the things within the impact portfolio that we are really excited about working on is how to allow localized KPIs to be true wherever they are at, at the, you know, the ground level, the, the local level, and still be able to identify translation, some kind of like language to roll these localized KPIs up into meaningful data on a global level to help with elevated decision making, to help with collaborative data share and all those, all those kinds of things that can become possible uh, when we're not just playing in our siloed lanes. So we're getting to utilize the intelligences of those smart goals and linear um, progress, uh, but we're doing it in a framework of exponential collaboration that is um, already, it's already built to be a learning model. Nothing ever has to get trapped um, where it was set because we want to be seeing the trajectories grow and become what they never would have been before on their own. Um, so I just wanted to drop that in there because I don't know if you knew that about the impact portfolio that we're we're kind of KPI relatively KPI well, heavy on the, on I, the individual I saw it, but I didn't. It didn't. Page. It didn't make my neck swell. It didn't make uh, make me get mad. Um, but a lot of times when I hear, like I do a lot with KPMG and Deloitte and Ernst and Young and Price Waterhouse Coopers, one of my books was. I wrote with uh, Deloitte, the other one with the last, the, not this last one, but the one before was with PricewaterhouseCoopers. And um, they talk about a lot. A lot of companies talk about it, but they don't know why they talk about it and they don't realize where it's going. When I read the impact portfolio, I see it more as living systems. I see it as living key performers. Uh, performing indexes and so I see it in a much different way and also the way you've structured it is as much uh, uh, different. Um, I don't think our guests or our listeners know what we're talking about when, when we talk about the impact uh, portfolio um, of uh, what what we mean so I actually would like you to maybe back up a little bit and talk about what it is and what it will be and where you're at and, and uh, get us excited about it. Sure. Um, so briefly, I guess I'll say that I did get this download from having gone to Davos pretty much on accident a couple of years ago and seeing these grand disparities between all these fund managers that I was meeting who were, um, you know, maybe never quite satisfied with where the money was going, whether it was needing to perform for profit or needing to perform for impact or some combination of the two. And then coming over into these rooms where some of the most innovative um, minds on the planet were working on solutions for humanity. And they were having to spend exorbitant amounts of money for stage time to give these pitches where maybe one or two people in the room could be out of 60 or 100 or 150 could be a, a good match uh, for funding what it was that they were presenting. And so I thought this is just a great mismatch of my lifetime. And I 
I don't know what to do about that. And in the months that ensued, I ended up getting several downloads about this. And then a, a group of volunteers got together to help put it together. And now what we have is the impact portfolio, which is emerging models for global efficiency and impact ROI. Um, we, we work on, uh, we work because of trying to get humanity beyond its barriers to self-organization because we know that self-organization is required for evolution. And so we see those barriers as being the modalities of being totally siloed in most cases, especially with the best work or the most meaningful work that's being done on the planet. Um, the metrics being an issue for those same reasons that we've talked about before. There's not a, there isn't a standard um, for, for what is gonna show that we're actually moving for, forward, partially because they're so siloed and partially because um, they're, we're perhaps not looking at the full picture. Um, also the issue of media, because it is our number one form of communication on the planet right now. Um, I mean, the, the last time that we had this, this big communication burst was the internet and the last time before then was the printing press. So we are at this critical juncture where media, it was really worth taking a deeper look at how do we want for it to be portraying what it is that we um, need to be communicating as humanity for humanity in order to move humanity forward. Uh, and then money, the issue that I mentioned in the beginning. So we set up these um, models that are uh, for optimizing and connecting the most effective organizations for global systems change. And we focused on, on impact, media, collaboration, technology, and data. Um, I, I do like to say that, so I wanted to tell you what the premise, the premise was. Um, I do like to say that the solutions to the challenges that humanity is facing are finite and measurable. And because they're finite and they're measurable, they're executable. I think a lot of people think that because there's 8 billion people on the planet and the, the problems that we have are so big and they're so ingrained that there's nothing we can do about it. It's all going to be a drop in the bucket. But I like to tell people that a drop in the bucket really does matter. If you take a bucket of just plain water and then you drop some red dye in there, you're going to get a tent to that water. So even the little drops make a difference. And also we're looking at doing things that allow for systemic change that can collapse time and wave function and get some of these things rolled out that'll make a difference on the planet. So we're utilizing available resources that are that are already here, no reinventing the wheel. We're adding organized collaboration and a scaling capacity in order to garner global efficiency. And we're doing this with some of the, I mentioned our fund manager um, from Accenture, but we're doing this with some of the um, top people on the planet in, in their various arenas like pro-social world, uh, who is handling our collaboration optimization. They're fully funded by Templeton, they're IRB certified. Um, they're utilizing Eleanor Ostrom's Nobel Prize winning core design principles model along with other models um, that they developed. We have uh, David Gershon who, um, he founded the first Earth Run in 1986, the one that uh, caused ceasefires and stopped wars. He's also the founder of the Empowerment Institute. So he's working with our, our members on, uh, our member organizations on theory of change. And uh, we're working with um, the uh, impact, geno or impact Genomics, which was founded by Seth Blaustein and is advised by Tom Chi, formerly of Google X, where they're quantifying the impact that each organization does, but not only in linear metric ways, they're looking at things like transparency and, um, and wisdom uh, and innovation, and even how these organizations relate with one another. And then we also have a global data collaborative that is a conversation about what's possible through data and data share, rapid prototyping collaborations that draft new models for what's possible through data, and a media engine that works with regenerative finance distribution models. Unify is a part of that, our other partners, um, Portal, Hubcast Media, we have many, many uh, more than I can, and can name in this podcast, but essentially it's a, it's a new model um, for, for new times so that we can begin to move into what's possible. And for the organization out there, how, how does the impact portfolio benefit them? Who's it for? Who are you looking for? What, what are you hoping to do? Is there, do you already have certain fund size on the horizon, is there thing anything coming emerging or coming up that you're excited about that you want to share us for and, and how um, 
the next person, let's say, at the Holo Movement coming up here in, in a couple of days that is there and they hear about the impact uh, portfolio, how can they help? How can they use it for themselves? What, what does it mean? Yeah, great questions. So we are uh, looking for partners, future members, and funders. Um, our setup right now for the full raise for the beta is a $100 million fund. The way that the fund works is that a portion of the fund goes to fund the operations for the container itself that, that uh, fosters the collaboration and then helps deliver these outcomes. But not just linear outcomes, it's outcomes of functionality for each organization and the individuals themselves. So development they take with them doesn't have to be paid for over again. So that happens, and then the rest of the funds go into grant distribution for the members themselves. So all the members of the impact portfolio, they go through this collaborative process, and they're being optimized in all these areas, the media, the, the data, um, anything that they really want to work on. But they're doing that in a collaborative context, so they, they get to have the, um, the purview of like, hey, this is what it looks like for all of these other people in this cohort to be going through this too, gaining that wisdom, gaining that context, and then making their decisions and their progress from that, um, that larger horizon. Um, then on top of that, they're getting grant funds, so they can just get money to keep doing what they were already doing really well. Um, but, but just now they get uh, an up level in all these different areas and they get to do that together. So we also have that model available after the second beta. Um, I've already been asked by different organizations and companies if this can be purchased, if it's something that they can just participate in by the, by the, uh, the program essentially. So we do have that on the horizon for 2026. But right now we're in the middle of that $100 million raise. We have an individual who's talking with us um, about uh, giving directly 35 million of that. And then uh, another couple organizations we're talking with about potentially doing matching funds. Um, but we do want to get to that 100 million re relatively quickly because we want to be able to show the scaling capacity so that this model can help with the planet's dollars. Um, it isn't, this isn't a model that is about making money for one organization. This is a model that we hope we, we test and prove and then give it to the world and anybody who can use it can use it. Uh, it's going to help. It's going to make money, but it's going to make more than just money. Um, it's going to make this exponential progress um, wherever it goes. So we're super excited about that. We are in the middle of a $500,000 raise that's just for the June cohort. So that's more on the immediate need side than the millions that take months to, to transact. Um, and then for members and partners, we are seeking the other people in the world who are playing at this level. If we want to talk about global data, what's possible for humanity, um, you know, kind of not turning these systems on their head, but kind of turning these systems on their head by, by uh, thinking outside the box um, and having some of these heart centered models. We want to talk to those people, especially people that are working um, with maybe measuring um, bioregions or other kinds of things that, that we can work alongside and partner and be better together. Um, and then future members, um, right now we have the, the beta cohort that is set up, but we are taking applications for um, organizations that want to be members in future tiers. Um, and really, if you're doing good on the planet, you don't even have to be a nonprofit organization. You can be a company and still participate. In fact, we want um, a combination of companies and nonprofit organizations because we don't feel we feel there should be a leveling of the playing field as far as how we as humans uh, show up and, and perform and collaborate, regardless of the structure of our organizations. Um, so we're really promoting that kind of togetherness in that way. So we would love to hear from anyone who fits into those uh, three categories and would be really excited to sprint alongside you while we co-create the new futures. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. We'll put a link in the description along with your other links where they can find all that. Um, I have a bunch of more questions that we need to talk about before we're done. We're, we're close, but not that close because I'm not going to let you off the hook. Um, I want to know uh, a few things that we, we've probably discussed uh, offline before but not never online. Um, do you consider yourself to be a global citizen? And why? Yes. <laughs> um, well, yes, because all of the other kinds of citizenship 
were thought of after the globe. <laughs> I was first born unto the globe and then unto probably my parents and then the nation that had set up the parameters that, that keep us uh, uh, physically in certain systems while we're living out this life. So I think that's how I see it. Great. And I, how about you? And I see, I, I, I see you as a global citizen as well because I've seen you interact with um, – all different cultures and people, and you're very, very well received in, in, in all circles that I've seen you in. And um, that really goes to the to the bigger um, question about the future in the context how we first met at the Dubai Future Forum. I have been doing a social experiment for eight years now, asking about 3,600 people uh, on video the question, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? And I really want to get that answer from you before. Now, I've, I think I have a couple of videos of you answering it before, but this is the, yeah. the official podcast uh, answer, and, and uh, I want, want to hear what your answer is. Yeah, we'll have to pull up the, the other one and, <laughs> and compare the answers. I don't remember what I said, but... Um, you know, I think about this uh, ever since you brought this up. I think about it all the time, um, and I think about the the history of it at the World's Fair and uh, and what you said about even people calling you up and saying like, "Hey, I, can I change my answer?" <laughs> um, and it and so it um, made me think that this is a question that makes people think, um, and and it has done that with me for sure. Um, I, I think part of the hang up for my analytical mind has been that in, in the, the semantics about what it might mean for a world to work for someone, like what does it mean for a world to work for you? I wonder if there are people that would, um, that would feel like a world that works for them needs to look a way that I would perceive to be imbalanced. And I don't know, I, I, you know, I don't know what the answer, you might have a better pulse on that because you've asked it so many thousands of times um, to so many thousands of people. But um, for me, I guess the best that I can do to answer it would just be to go back to what I envision as what I would perceive as working, <laughs> which would be um, really being in that beautiful symbiotic state and for me like these this year probably into a bit of last year I feel like I see these kinds of Taurus fields in everything like I look out at the ocean and I look at people walking and I just see that there's there's so much potent life force energy in a in a being and in not just potential in terms of like oh you could do or be anything but like in potential of literal, like you are walking magic, my friends, like what, what would you like to make of it? Um, but I see that like in my cup of water, I see it in like the thing, the things that I'm interacting with. And I imagine that, that we have only not even scratched the surface of what's possible when those systems begin to interact. Because if I could take a Taurus field times a Taurus field times a Taurus field times a Taurus field, times a Taurus field and let those things do their natural like mycelial energy web thing what would i find what would we see what would become available then i when i'm imagining a world that works for everyone i'm thinking that people are resting into that beautiful symbiotic um exchange that that literally it doesn't take more from you it takes less from you because you don't need to be on burnout to survive that that's totally counterintuitive um and the things like life should be a discovery of 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 who we are and what we love and what we can fall in love with and who who we can be and what we see in each other and what we see in ourselves all of this is like a, a learning exploration discovery all the time so can people have a place where they're where they have the freedom and the space and the breath to do that, to discover themselves and to just have the, have a full life. I strongly desire 
for the world, <laughs> for humanity to be able to have a place like that where they can relax into being and, uh, and trust that, that good things come, that there is enough, that you are enough, that everything is whole. Thank you so much. I, 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 I don't know if my last one might have been less long-winded than that one. <laughs> no, I think they were about the same length. <laughs> I, 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 you, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm very long-winded. So, all I, I don't ever give the short version. I think sometimes that can be fr frustrating for for people. Um, I feel there's so much eco literacy and and. Um, wisdom out there that that is not taught or not discussed or not gone into depth uh, about that really frames a lot of of our realities thought leads to to action you know um i guess in some respects are trying to make thinking cool again on on this podcast <laughs> get people into thinking things into action and you're so right the question um is one that gets people to think. It gets people to think about it and see if they've ever thought about it before and maybe put some effort and some, some time into it to see what it would be like for them and, and to feel the feelings that come to even know and feel that you you have a say in what does a world that works for everyone look like, that you can imagine that. You have a birthright to actually say yeah what i i can it's okay for me to voice what a world that works for everyone looks like um and the reason the reason why uh, for me that i really have taken up the social experiment and kind of the call is i know that if if you don't know the answer to that question it's perfectly fine to not know to go through life or to be a child or to be someone elderly or with dementia or or whatever situation in life, and just not know the answer at all. You've never ever thought of it, or or taken the time. Uh, one one tells me that I'm I'm sorry because we've probably messed up our world so much that you're you're not living the best life you could live, and um, life has just gotten too overwhelming. But I know for a fact, if you don't know the answer to that, it's okay but someone has jumped into that position into your life and is guiding you on the future that they think is a world that works for everyone. Either a priest, a parent, a religious leader, some religious leader, some other type of leader, a mayor, a governor, a senator, a president, um, a mother, father, a grandparent, or someone has jumped into that position and says, we're going on this future, this is what we're doing, and created structures and frameworks and things that, that are leading leading you, us, in that direction. But if you know the answer, or even a little bit of what you think is right, then you also can take part into how that future is run and how it occurs, or you can give feedback to say, I don't want to go in that 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 future, and I'm not going to spend my money or my time or my thoughts uh, pursuing that because I'm not happy with that future. I'm not happy um, with this so-called work-life balance or or um, the way things are going. And that is uh, it's not only a power, but it's a gift of of symbiosis to kind of say. I want to go with other living systems. I want to flow in a different direction and I, I, uh, um, because I believe in it as something that I have buy-in to the system. Uh, if you can have people who have buy-in and know that vision, they will work hard. They will work long hours. Because they will work with passion, their heart with love, compassion, desire, and collaboration. All the time, you you said it yourself. Today's Sunday, and we're having a podcast in the evening. You're in beautiful Italy, in a beautiful, close to the beach, in a beautiful area. I'm in Hamburg, 
and um, yet we're here having a discussion. And uh, that's because, and nobody's paying us. Uh, it's because we're passionate. We believe in what we do. We know what a world that works for everyone looks like, and we're we're willing to put our time and effort into that to move forward. So if you know that answer, that drives us all forward. And that's kind of the background to that that story. Um, if I, I travel around the world a lot and do a lot of events and work a lot of international organizations, and I have to tell you. None of them are presenting me with a future or a system where I can say, wow, I want to go on, on that future. That sounds really great. It's they're really taking care of me, my family, my kids' schools, my grandkids' schools. I can feel safe and secure, and I'll put my life and my hands in, 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 their, in their, uh, their hands um, and let them guide me. I just don't feel that, and I don't see it. Um, the only organization in the world that I think is really doing good things for for our Earth is the European Union with the taxonomy and the ESG. I think it's going in many directions in the right direction, and it's really caring about a lot of big majority of people. They're talking about new economic models and new living systems, but otherwise, I just don't really see a lot of people on there. So. I've come up with a new way. You've come up with a new way. We've collaborated with many other great events and people who are also kind of uh, on this journey. And, and we're, uh, we're, we're not pushing back, but we're aligning and having this symbiotic relationship to kind of collaborate and cooperate for better futures. And so uh, enough about that or me or the question, but it was just, I just really wanted to frame it, let you, let you and our listeners know why I'm so obsessed about asking that question and what the importance behind it is. Because a lot of people say, "Well, it's not important for you to know that," and and that, and in some respects, they're right. And in others, when the hard times come and they'll realize why they're in a certain place, it's because they weren't involved in the process of life to get us there. So. I not leaving this podcast on a bummer note or anything because it's uh, supposed to be very positive uh, and and it has been a sheer pleasure to talk to you but I want to know what have you experienced or learned in your journey of life and your professional journey in life so far that you would have loved to know from the start hmm well from the start in life, if there was you, one even thing, even if I there's a couple things, you know, so start. just something that maybe in, in in your life or your professional uh, life, or uh, even as within Unify, that you just would have loved to know that you've learned over the years, that you would have loved to know from the start. Maybe loved to learn it at school, or had a mentor, or somehow got gotten that, that information from the from the beginning. Yeah, I think it would just be like, go ahead and release that cloak of self-judgment. I think releasing the cloak of self-judgment has been the best thing that I have ever done. And it serves serves me in my life, my holistic life, like to your point, work, life and home life are not really separate. I'm me in all of those places and I present as me in all those places my health and wellness and my state of being is going to affect how I show up um, and I'm able to be present and effective um, in those spaces. So yeah, I think for me, that's the, that's the biggest one. And I think that it's also one that from doing all my coaching work over the years and advising work over the years that I've also seen is very prevalent in our society. We have a lot to be judgeful about judgy about with ourselves and others, but it really starts with us. So if I could go back and teach that to myself earlier, I think I would maybe have had a faster trajectory. Perfect. Thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas. Tammy, Michelle, Scarlett, thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>